just continue um, where we left off. Um, and I had introduced um, the reasons why uh, steel is uh, an important material in, uh, in engineering. And um, we um, I had also explained that uh, in this introductory lectures, we would be focusing on general physical metallurgy of steel. So um, the um, kind of stage was set to, um, to go into the products um, in more detail. One of the things that, uh, that happens the first time one is confronted with, uh, with steels is the fact that um, uh, when you look at the steel compositions, yes, the, um, it appears as if uh, uh, there's so many elements uh, making uh, the composition of that steel. Uh, which, uh, uh, I remember myself, um, as a young engineer looking at steel composition, I had the impression that um, the, uh, the entire table of Mendeleev had gone into uh, designing the composition of the steel. Um, and so I uh, always make it a point uh, uh, with this course to uh, dispel this idea and actually uh, show you uh, that uh, there quite a few, um, relatively few elements that go into uh, the uh, design of steels. Um, and um, so let's have a look at this table. Uh, so it's the periodic table of elements. Um, and you see uh, iron there in the middle. So um, if I remove the elements that are relatively uh, not of importance to uh, steel design, uh, you can see that um, we're, we're still left with uh, quite a few elements that um, steel makers, and it doesn't matter whether they make specialty steels or um, uh, carbon steel, which steel makers will analyze routinely. Hmm? So why do they do this? Uh, Well, first of all, um, there are, they do this because uh, some of these elements they analyze and that you find back in the um, sheets, analysis sheets of the steels um, are just alloying elements. They're just added to the steel composition. Yeah? And uh, the basic alloying elements uh, in steels are, are indicated here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, I'm talking about carbon steel at this stage. The elements are, uh, other than iron, of course, manganese, aluminum, silicon, carbon. And then um, I have also added calcium, yes. Um, calcium is added to steels, not so much as a alloying element uh, to um, change the steel's properties, yes, uh, directly, but it has an impact on the inclusions, means the non-metallic oxide inclusions that are uh, in the steel. And so in order to give these inclusions the right chemistry and physical properties so that they don't have negative effects, we add this calcium metal to the steel in a process called calcium treatment. Mm? Second in, in, the, in the step processing, a step that we call secondary metallurgy. Um, and so that's how this, the calcium gets into the steel. Mm? Um, all right, so these elements. Then um, there are uh, quite a few elements uh, that we routinely keep track of in our steels, not because we intentionally added them to the steel composition, but because they are contaminants, yes? And we generally, in the, in the, in the 
industry, we, we call them tramp elements. These are basically unwanted elements, impurities that um, come from the ore that we use to make steel or from the scrap that we use to make steels, the ferro alloys that we use to make steel, etc. And, um, and, and you can see there actually quite a lot of these elements are, uh, are present there. And some of these elements will be um, impurities, other times they will also be alloying elements in specific cases. But anyway, let's, let's look at the list of these um, uh, trap elements. You have tin, antimony, lead, bismuth, yes? arsenic, selenium, phosphorus, sulfur, yes, um, hydrogen, yes, it's picked up uh, during the, the making, treating of steels, and copper. I can't go into all the details about these elements, but I, I do want to say a few things about, for instance, copper and um, tin, yes, uh, when you use um, um, steel that is produced via the electric arc furnace route, yes, you need to uh, use um, scrap as um, input material to your electric furnace. Uh, it may be that this scrap is contaminated by copper uh, bearing um, uh, metals, or uh, copper wire, for instance, yes. Um, and you will find this copper back as impurity in your steel. Uh, it may be that um, you're using um, uh, materials that contain tin, yes. Um, Tin-coated uh, steels, for instance, or lead um, uh, uh, residues or impurities, and so they, they will end up being in your in your steel, hmm? okay? And they're not alloy elements, uh, they're basically impurities, and if possible, you want their concentration to be as low as possible. Phosphorus and sulfur come basically from the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, ore that we use to, um, to make iron and steels. Um, we want their concentration to be extremely low, yes? Um, less than 100 ppm in many cases because they have negative impact on the mechanical properties. Mm -hmm. Having said this, there are steels where we uh, add phosphorus uh, to increase the strength, phosphorus being a very potent solid solution and sulfur, uh, in certain cases, we will add high concentrations of sulfur to make the steels more machinable, give them a, more, a better machinability. Mm -hmm. This uh, so sometimes in impurity uh, is an alloying element, is used as an alloying element. But in general, we can say phosphorus, sulfur are impurities and we'd like to have their concentration as low as possible. We have uh, talked about the gamma alpha transformation. Yes, it's actually a very important uh, transformation in um, uh, when we when we try to generate interesting microstructures in steels. And um, we there are many elements that we add to uh, carbon steels to control this gamma to alpha transformation. And important elements in this respect are chrome, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, and boron. Yes. Again, we'll talk about this in more detail as we go, but uh, say, for instance, boron is an element that is extremely efficient in suppressing this gamma to alpha transformation. And it does this in a very special way. It, um, it goes and sit, segregates its austenite phase, uh, austenite grain boundaries, excuse me, 
And when the transformation to a ferrite is supposed to start by grain boundary nucleation of ferrite, this process cannot happen, doesn't happen. It's suppressed by the presence of boron at the um, grain boundaries. So boron um, effectively uh, retards, very effectively retards the austenite to ferrite transformation. That's why we call these uh, elements transformation controlling fissions. Okay? And uh, so very often uh, these elements are part of the uh, design of this steel composition. And then we have uh, uh, special alloy additions. Depending on the application, uh, we will uh, add uh, specific elements to obtain certain properties. And let's just uh, review a few of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you have titanium, vanadium, and niobium. This group three elements, yes, is uh, well known as microalloying additions. That means uh, that we add minute amounts of these uh, uh, elements to achieve uh, a very uh, uh, large, relatively large improvement in strength, yes, and uh, via grain size reduction. We have steels uh, that are very, uh, that have been engineered to, uh, so that they can be used as very hard and that uh, they can be used as tool steel to machine uh, materials. Chrome, moly, tungsten are typical additions we make to the steel. Uh, these elements, these six elements, yes, um, form, are not present uh, in the final product as uh, pure solutes, but as carbides, and they're very strong carbide formers. Okay. Elements such as copper uh, can be added uh, because it gives me precipitation strength, that we can, we can engineer the steel, design the steel so that copper, uh, instead of being an uh, uh, impurity, yes, acts as a, uh, contributes to the strength by forming tiny little uh, uh, precipitates in the ferrite matrix and thereby giving us a uh, effect called precipitation strengthening. And then uh, we have uh, elements such as uh, sulfur, I already discussed this, um, or lead uh, that are used to, uh, for, to improve the machining, machinability of, uh, of steels. Phosphorus uh, can be added also as a strengthening addition. So the, the situation with certain elements is uh, positive or negative, uh, certain, many cases, phosphorus and, and sulfur are considered to be impurities, which have a negative impact on the steel for a particular application. In other cases, um, we will add a controlled amount of phosphorus or, or, or um, sulfur for a specific application. Okay. Special steels. Um, uh, will use special elements. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, in mar aging steels, we have uh, cobalt additions. Cobalt additions. In um, stainless steels, we will have, depending on the type of stainless steels, we will have uh, special additions. So in ferritic stainless steels, we add chrome and molybdenum to improve the corrosion uh, performance of these uh, steels. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need at least 10 to 12 percent of, of chrome, yes, and a few percents of molybdenum mm -hmm. to 
achieve this. When we use, uh, when we design stainless steels, uh, which uh, that are austenitic, FCC, uh, metastable crystal structure at room temperature, uh, we need to add nickel. So important here is that the nickel is does not contribute to the corrosion uh, property, but is uh, the element that we add to stabilize the austenite at room temperature. Very often, stainless steels, austenitic stainless steels, are also uh, alloyed with nitrogen because nitrogen gives the addition to solid solution strengthening of the austenite, also an added corrosion resistance. All right, and we continue with special steels. Hmm? Uh, uh, steels with up to 3% of uh, silicon are used in um, many electrical applications for to uh, make electrical motors, to make transformers, yes. Uh, these steels uh, are alloyed with silicon. Silicon is added because it has an impact on the resistivity of, uh, uh, of iron and also um, there's an additional reasons why we add silicon uh, which are related Crystallographic orientation. Okay. What else can we say about alloying elements? Okay, so now we know that uh, no, uh, the um, uh, the, the um, uh, we don't use all the elements in the periodic table to make a steel. No, we do actually quite a few. Uh, there are a strict number of elements that we add in steel design uh, and. When we add them, it's because they um, have confer certain properties to the steel. Um, how uh, these elements, uh, what their influence is, varies. Hmm? Um, in general, uh, when a element is added to the steel composition, it will have an impact on the relative stability of the austenite and the ferrite phase. Yes. Um, it, uh, uh, it can form, it can stay in solution, yes. It can also form precipitates. Good. Or it can segregate. What do I mean by this? Yes. Uh, so on the left here, uh, we see a schematic of steel uh, with the grain boundary. So the elements that we added substitutional or um, uh, interstitial elements can be in, in solid solution, so for instance, in supersaturated solid solution. And then when they're supersaturated solid solution, they can precipitate. They form, they can form precipitates. And these precipitates can be intergranular, i.e. at grain boundaries, or they can be intragranular means the precipitates are inside the matrix. This would be, for instance, uh, the larger atoms would be niobium atoms, and the smaller blue, dark blue atoms would be carbon, and uh, the, uh, the compound that we form would be niobium carbide, for instance. Okay, and these are a few examples here. Um, so these, this is an example for titanium nitride. So uh, typically, when titanium is added to steels, yes, it will uh, almost readily form uh, titanium nitrides in the liquid uh, phase already because of the very high thermodynamic stability of the uh, titanium nitride and the very low solubility of this nitride in steel. 
And you can see here this particle, yes, a nice uh, large particle uh, of titanium nitride. Very often, these precipitates uh, of titanium nitride act as heterogeneous nucleation sites for compounds that precipitate at a later stage. Mm? This is an example here where manganese sulfide has precipitated onto uh, titanium nitride uh, particle. Yes? And this uh, precipitation of manganese sulfide uh, has happened in the solid state uh, and, uh, and, and the titanium nitride provides a uh, substrate for the uh, manganese sulfide. Other examples here of uh, precipitates this time that are much finer, yes? And uh, so this is um, uh, what we call an extraction replica of a steel containing uh, niobium carbide precipitates. And you can see the small black uh, dots on the image on the left that these are niobium carbide precipitates. In this particular, for this particular steel, yes, which contained titanium and nitrogen, we had again titanium nitride precipitates on which niobium carbide formed a uh, precipitated, heterogeneously uh, nucleated uh, at lower temperature. So, uh, in carbon steels, uh, uh, there are numerous uh, possible precipitates, but the, the very important precipitates are carbides, yes? And we have a number of um, carbides here. In general, yes, uh, if you think about, again, about the... Uh, table of Mendeleev, the periodic table of elements, yes. Um, the elements that are on the left of iron form carbides. Elements on the right hand side do not form carbides. So that's why I reproduce here the section of a uh, segment of the periodic table where the alloying elements that we encounter in steels yes, uh, and, and their carbides. So, first of all, iron itself, iron itself forms a stable carbide called cementite that you may know, but it also forms what we call transition carbides, low temperature transition carbides. And these, are, these carbides are not thermodynamically stable, yes? So that means if it given the chance, they will readily transform to cementite. But in steels, we observe them very commonly because they precipitate, when carbon precipitates out of ferrite, when it's in supersaturation in ferrite and precipitates out, it will usually not form cementite right away but it will form these intermediate phases, these low temperature transition carbides, which are typically called epsilon carbide or eta carbide, and have chemical formulas such as Fe2C. Okay. Manganese, the element right next to iron on the left, in the periodic table. Uh, we, there are known carbides for manganese, yes, but in general, yes, the stability of these manganese uh, carbides is relatively low, and in practice, you almost never ever uh, have to deal with them. Instead, elements such as chrome, moly, tungsten, vanadium, niobium, and titanium uh, for readily carbides, yes? These carbides, so if, if we move 
away from iron towards titanium. We go from less stable carbide to very stable carbides. Okay. And also, on the left, excuse me, on the right hand side of this table, we tend to see mixed carbides. Whereas on the right, on the, excuse me, on the right we see mixed carbides, on the left we see no mixed carbides. So titanium, yes, uh, uh, what, what do I mean with this? Yeah? For instance, uh, in the presence of manganese, for instance, cementite will very often contain not the pure Fe3C, but will some of the iron atoms will be replaced by manganese. So that is a mixed carbide. Um, the same if your alloy contains a little bit of molybdenum or tungsten, uh, the carbide, the cementite, will contain some, will some of the iron in the cementite will be replaced by the tungsten or the molybdenum. What carbide you, you, you get uh, depends entirely on the thermal, the, of course, the composition of your steel. Okay. Uh, the thermodynamic stability of the uh, carbide and the solubility of the carbide itself. Okay. And of course, don't forget, we have two allotropic forms of uh, iron, gamma iron, alpha iron, and the solubilities of these carbides in these two phases are different. For example, the solubility of a vanadium carbide in austenite is very high. So, however, um, uh, when you the phase boundary, when you transform the austenite to ferrite, the solubility of this vanadium carbide drops to very low values. So during the transformation, yes, you get a burst of precipitation of very fine vanadium carbide particles in your, in your um, at, at the interface. Yes. And, um, and, as, and we, we use this, for instance, to, uh, to get precipitation hardening in vanadium-bearing steels. All right. So we just talked uh, about um, carbides. Um, in low-carbon steels, many engineering applications, uh, for instance, in wire steels, in uh, wire steels, um, the Cementite, yes, uh, is the main uh, carbide, mm -hmm. but we always have alloying elements in our steel, yes, and um, very often what we'll see is that uh, some of the iron atoms in the cementite are, are replaced by um, uh, alloying elements, alloying addition, and so we get what we what is called partitioning of the alloying elements between the ferrite and the cementite. So it's kind of interesting, rather interesting to have a look at how this partitioning coefficient is between cementite and ferrite for alloying elements. This shown in this table, yes. So on the top you get the different alloying elements, silicon, cobalt, nickel, tungsten, moly, vanadium, manganese, and chrome. Yes. And so, so we go from elements which have no f uh, carbide forming tendency in uh, steels yes, to elements which are very strong carbide forms, such as uh, chromium. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The partitioning coefficient is the ratio of the uh, content of that element in the cementite divided by the, uh, the content in the alloy, in the, in the ferrite. Yeah? 
and we see, for instance, that uh, silica uh, is not very present in the cementite. Neither is cobalt or nickel. However, elements such as chromium yes, will heavily partition to the um, uh, uh, to the um, cementite, and so will molybdenum and vanadium, manganese. Yes, tungsten, not so much. Tungsten is a relatively large element; doesn't fit very well in the cementite lattice. So that may be a reason why uh, the partitioning is a little bit lower. Yes. Um, this partitioning uh, appears to be uh, uh, dependent on time and temperature. Hmm? For instance, if we uh, look at a so-called eutectoid steel, it's a steel which contains um, a lot of cementite, yes, and um, and we measure the uh, amount of, for instance, chrome in the uh, uh, cementite, yes, or the partitioning of the chrome, the, the ratio of the chrome in the cementite to the chrome in the ferrite, as a function of time at certain temperatures. And we see that when the transformation starts, that's when you form perlite, and in, in perlite you have it's a constituent that consists of it's a mixture of ferrite and perlite. If I look at the buildup of the chrome content in the cementite, I see that at 700, the partitioning is 1. So there is no chrome in the cementite originally. And as I wait, let time pass, 1 hour, 2 hours, 3 hours, 10 hours, the partitioning coefficient can be 15. That means there is 15 times more chromium in the carbide, in the cementite, than in the ferrite. Yes. Anyway, so it's time dependence and the temperature dependence. And this is here the time dependence. So you see that at the start of the transformation, partitioning coefficient is 1. And then gradually there is a buildup of the uh, left, the diagram is for chrome. On the right, the uh, diagram is for manganese partitioning. And you can see that the partitioning um, uh, of the manganese to the uh, cementite will increase with time and with temperature. In other words, in general, in steels, when we form cementite, it's pretty much Fe3C. Yes? It's after, if you keep the cementite at high temperature for a longer time, okay, you will get this replacement of the iron atoms by chromium, manganese, molybdenum. So when you form cementite at low temperature, it will probably be very pure cementite, if you can see. If it's at higher temperature, it, it, uh, there will be partitioning of alloying elements towards the all right, let's have a look a little bit at um, some key elements hmm, and their effect on the uh, um, on, on, on the basic thermodynamics and kinetics of the austenite to ferrite transformation. Hmm, okay, and a convenient way to do this, as you know from introductory courses in uh, physical metallurgy in your undergraduate years is to look at the phase diagrams and to look at uh, TTT diagrams, time, transformation, time, temperature diagrams. So we'll look first at the effect, uh, at, uh, uh, at the effect of manganese. And manganese, as I said, very uh, important key element in many carbon steels, okay? So let me use a pen here to make my point, okay? So on the left, 
you see an iron uh, carbon phase diagram, yes, yes. and uh, the red line I'm trying to indicate here is the boundary between the lower uh, boundary of the austenite stability range. Okay. And you can see that when I add manganese to uh, this, uh, or I calculate rather the phase diagram for higher manganese contents, 1%, 2%, etc. I see that the line, uh, this line goes down. In other words, I increase the stability range of austenite, and that's why we call manganese a austenite stabilizer. Yes. Uh, and um, so that is an important point. You can already see from uh, the fact on the equilibrium phase diagram, iron carbon pseudo uh, binary phase diagram, iron carbon phase diagram, we can already see that uh, manganese will uh, stabilize austenite relative to ferrite. Okay, but what will be the effect on the transformation? Hmm? Well, for that I need to look at the um, transformation uh, kinetics. So here we see the, on the right here, mm -hmm. this TTT diagram for a steel that has a near eutectoid composite. So that means that uh, when I cool austenite, yes, I will form basically perlite. Hmm? So let's have a look here. Uh, 0.9 carbon. So this is in this diagram, this would be around this point here. Right? So that is um, the composition. So most of the uh, transformation that we get, the phase diagram tells me that I should form uh, pro eutectoid cementite. It turns out that that's not is not is very slow uh, reaction. So most of the transformation that you you see in the phase diagram in the TTT diagram rather is a um, um, is is due to uh, perlite formation. So, and this is the transformation kinetics for very low half a percent of uh, manganese. So. Uh, the transformation starts at around 700 degrees C. Let's see if that's correct. Mm -hmm. So that is for, what did we say, a half a percent of manganese, right? So that would be here. Yes. So the transformation starts at around this, this point. Right? And then um, I have an increase in the, the kinetics of the transformation. That means the, tra the, the time for the transformation to start becomes shorter. And reaches a maximum of uh, 600. So what happens now when I increase? I go to 1.2, 2.9 percent of manganese. You can see that the stability range of the austenite decreases. Uh, excuse me, the stability range of the austenite increases. So the transformation starts at lower and lower temperature. Yes, that's one thing. Not only does the, but what also happens is that the kinetics in general, yes, are delayed. Mm? So the transformation mm, takes a much longer time to start. So if I have uh, half a percent of manganese, it, it takes me between one and two seconds at 600 degrees C to get the perlite formation started. If I have about 3% of manganese, it, uh, it takes me um, between 100 and 200 seconds to get the transformation to start. Okay. So there is a, uh, a pronounced uh, um, uh, effect 
of manganese on the transformation in the sense that it delays yes, the transformation. And um, this uh, phenomenon that, uh, or, or characteristic that certain elements have to delay the start of the transformation of austenite to ferrite or austenite to perlite, this process of austenite decomposition being delayed, yes, we will uh, relate this later to uh, uh, the concept of hardenability. Okay, right. Um, what about silicon? Well, silicon, for one thing, is an element that, um, in contrast to, os uh, to excuse me, uh, manganese, has a very different uh, effect. It stabilizes ferrite. So when we add uh, silicon, again, to a near eutectoid composition, hmm, yes, what we see is that the temperature at which the transformation will start increases. So that means we reduce the size of the austenite stability layer. We have an element that is ferrite stabilizer rather than austenite stabilizer like uh, uh, manganese was. And then we see another thing is that so at uh, 0 0.1% silicon, this was the transformation, yes. and at 2% um, of silicon, this is the transformation. So here I seem to, um, rather than to uh, uh, delay the yeah, uh, transformation, I have a uh, transformation that is faster, certainly in this temperature range here, in this, in this particular temperature range. Okay. So what is happening here? Well, silicon being a ferrite stabilizer, it will accelerate ferrite formation. Yes? And it will accelerate ferrite formation during the perlite formation and also when I have pro-eutectoid ferrite formation. That's called compositions, decompositions, which are uh, uh, less than the eutectoid composition of about 0.8% of carbon. Silicon also has an interesting uh, uh, characteristic, which we should know of, yes. um, because in certain species we, uh, we really use this property. Um, silicon is an element that um, does not, uh, as we've seen earlier, does not um, uh, go into the cementite. Yes. So, we, that's one thing, it doesn't, it doesn't go it doesn't uh, dissolve or partition to cementite. The other thing, uh, property of silicon, is that it, um, it increases the carbon activity in solution. Yeah? Uh, so, in, and here is some data for ferrite, yeah? and you see what is the change in the uh, carbon activity when I add you know, similar amounts of chrome, moly, manganese, nickel, silicon, and phosphorus? You know, when I add silicon and phosphorus, I see an increase in the activity of carbon. If I add molybdenum, manganese, and chromium, I see a decrease. What does that uh, have for consequence? 
has a very important consequence because in many cases the addition of silicon will result in a suppression of cementite formation. And the, um, the reason why this happens is believed to be the following. So when we, and it's illustrated on the figure in, in the right hand side, yes, okay, of the uh, slide. So when we form, say we form a little bit of cementite, Nucleus of cementite in uh, in ferrite. Okay, so uh, because um, silicon does not partition to uh, cementite or doesn't dissolve in cementite or is not soluble in cementite, it gets expelled. It basically gets expelled. Yes, expelled out of this cementite. Yes. So um, what you uh, can say is that. Uh, around a uh, small uh, cementite nucleus, I will have a silicon concentration profile that looks like this. Yes. It, it increases, the silicon content increases towards the uh, phase boundary cementite um, This, this should be fair. Okay, so this, um, so the silicon content increases. Now, what is the consequence of uh, the uh, this, this high interfacial silicon concentration? Yes. Well, the following. In order for the cementite to grow, I need to have carbon diffuse towards the cementite. Yes? Okay. Now, diffusion is controlled by concentration profiles. Actually, it's controlled by uh, free energy profiles. It's controlled by activity. Yes, it's activity. So if the carbon activity profile is like this, I will get a flux of carbon towards the uh, cementite particle. However, in this particular region around the precipitate, I have a high silicon content. And this results in an increase of the carbon activity around this cementite particle. And so this increase can be such that the, uh, there is no carbon activity gradient anymore yes, around my cementite, and the cementite particle cannot grow. Yes. So in other words, and, and this is the more efficient, the more silicon we have in our uh, steel. Okay? So silicon has in, uh, other, in addition to being a ferrite stabilizer, yes, um, it also has as a characteristic that it suppresses cementite uh, formation. Ferrite stabilizer and suppressing cementite formation very efficiently. I do have to say that um, elements such as phosphorus and aluminum are also um, also have this property, and um, in in certain um, uh, uh, iron alloys called cast irons, yes, uh, silicon is, uh, is is added to uh, promote the formation of graphite, yes, rather than cementite, yes. Um, we call it this this property of silicon to uh, suppress carbide formation is, is in these steels, in these alloys, in these, sorry, alloys, um, cast iron alloys is called the graphitizing properties of, so it's referred to as the graphitizing properties of um, um, silicon. Um, 
Right. So what's the effect of other elements, such as, in particular, uh, of particular interest, uh, chromium and molybdenum? So first of all, uh, so chromium has a, a, a quite uh, wide-ranging spectrum of effects. Yeah? So let's, let's have a look at what uh, happens. Yeah? So here, first of all, uh, we have an effect of chrome on the um, um, phase diagram, yeah, on, on thermodynamic stability. Yeah. And it also has an effect on, on the decomposition of osmium. So that's something we see in TTT diagram. So first of all, um, so chromium additions, <coughs> uh, we see in general that <coughs> um, if we have small amounts of chromium, um, small amounts of chromium, the chromium can be at um, um, actually an austenite stabilizer. Not very strongly, as you can see, not very strong, but it's um, a um, austenite stabilizer. Um, in general, um, the um, effect of chromium is rather limited in, in for the, the kind of um, chromium concentrations, amounts of chromium we add uh, for um, rock carbon steel. Uh, the effect of chromium is, however, important when we look at TTT diagrams. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so when you um, add, uh, for instance, you, you have here a steel with um, all point on the left lower uh, side of the slide with 1% uh, of chrome, yes. After adding up to 4% of chrome, we can see that the Bainite transformation, that's one of the, the composition reactions that we will talk about uh, in more details, yes, um, is um, moved to the Pressed, yes, Bainite transfer. What is also very important is that the perlite transformation, yes, is strongly suppressed. Yeah. All right, so uh, these uh, TTT diagrams on the left here are calculated. So if you want uh, real steel, a uh, steel, an engineering steel, yes. We see that uh, as we uh, add uh, chromium, we get a suppression of the ferrite, in particular, uh, and perlite transformation, yes. Uh, but an extension of the bainite transformation. So let's have a look at this, uh, this diagram in more detail now. Yeah. So uh, this is a carbon steel, but with 0.4% of carbon, we call these steels engineering steels. Yeah. 1.5 manganese, got some silicon also. And um, it's got um, a little bit of molybdenum. And this is the, uh, well, uh, continuous cooling transformation diagram for that steel, yes. And we, uh, we have no chromium in this steel. So here we have the transformation region for the uh, ferrite perlite, and here we have the bainite transformation, yes, okay. Um, right, and so if we now see what happens to uh, this CCT diagram, I can see that uh, the ferrite and cementite transformation are uh, suppressed, they are delayed, yes, whereas the um, bainite transformation is slightly expanded, yes, and um, uh, um, okay. 
chromium, as I said, um, has a tendency to partition, to symmetrize. Yes. We um, have to put, um, we have to say a few things about this. Yes. Um, I've already told you that the chromium is one of these elements that does like to partition to cementite, and that this phenomenon of partitioning to, to cementite was time and temperature dependent, yes? So let's have a look at that in particular for chromium, yes? Uh, we look at a steel here, which contains 0.8% of carbon, so it's a eutectoid steel. So uh, basically transformation uh, uh, that you get is perlite formation. Yes. And so these are the kinetics, the TTT diagram for the uh, formation of perlite and for the formation of bainite. Yes. So this is the first line, the start of the transformation. And uh, so at high temperature, I get perlite formation. At low temperature, I get bainite formation. And if we now track the uh, partitioning of chromium, mm, partitioning coefficient of chromium um, at different temperatures. So we look at what is the enrichment of the chromium in this cementite at different temperatures. Yes. We see that the uh, perlite mm, that we form at, say, uh, close to 750, yes, um, the partitioning is the coefficient is about 50. Yes. However, as the temperature at which we carry out the transformation to perlite uh, is decreased, we see a steady drop of this partitioning coefficient. That means that um, at 700 degrees C, the partitioning, yes, is down to five, yes, and at uh, five, uh, six hundred, yes, it's down to less, you know, about uh, two and a half or, or so, yes, okay. And in the bainite, during the bainite transformation, the partitioning coefficient is one. There is no partition, okay. In equilibrium, the partitioning of chromium to the cementite should be actually very large order of uh, 30 to 40 percent um, an increase with lower temperature. In practice you see a very different picture and the reason of course is that partitioning requires diffusion yes? and so uh, the lower the temperature is at which we carry out the transformation uh, the less diffusion, the less the diffusion coefficient is of chromium and and so the lower the partitioning coefficient, yes? All right, so so partitioning is something that, that does occur, but uh, the extent to which it, um, it takes place depends on the, um, the conditions in which the cementite form, in particular the temperature and the time. Molybdenum is also an element just like chromium, strong carbide former, um, although it's not 100% correct, but um, we consider them in general to be ferrite stabilizer, although as I said earlier, mm. in the case of chromium, very low concentration in, in the binary iron chrome system. Um, chrome is definitely a austenite stabilizer. Yes. In, um, uh, so molybdenum mm, is an element that we uh, very often use in uh, many steels. Mm, and you've seen in the uh, 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 earlier part of the uh, lecture today that molybdenum and chrome are both used as uh, transformation controlling elements. So with molybdenum, mm, 
we see a, um, an effect that's similar as chromium. So again, here's some calculated PTT diagrams. Uh, we see what is the effect of going from a 0.55 carbon steel, going from 0.8 moly to 2% moly. What you see is that the ferrite and the perlite transformation yes, are clearly delayed. Kinetics of uh, the composition of austenite to, to ferrite and perlite are suppressed, whereas although the bainite start temperature is reduced, the S temperature, the temperature at which the bainite transformation starts is reduced, the kinetics, yes, are actually slightly increased. Okay. So the effect of molybdenum uh, additions is that, uh, in general, we can say that it delays diffusional transformations and it expands the bainite transformation. Diffusional transformations uh, are the decomposition, austenite decomposition reaction leading to ferrite and or perlite formation. Right, and let's, uh, and, uh, we'll have, so on the lower right-hand side, you can see what happens to a, uh, an engineering steel with 0.4% of carbon, 1.5% uh, uh, manganese, excuse me, when you increase the molybdenum content tenfold from 0.03% to 0.3%. Yes. So what happens is uh, shown in the next slide. So you can see that is the, this time it's the CCT diagram. Yes. It's a continuous cooling transformation diagram. You can see the region for the perlite all right, uh, transformation, and then the bainite. Yeah? So what happens now if I add molybdenum to this? Uh, this is the uh, corresponding uh, CCT diagram. You can see how strongly the ferrite and the perlite transformation are uh, suppressed, and the bainite transformation is promoted. So let's just go back one slide here. Yes. Say I have stable austenite at 900 degrees C, yes. and I cool this down to room temperature using this uh, cooling rate. Yes. When I do this, you can see that I will form ferrite and perlite, hmm? ferrite and perlite, ferrite and perlite, hmm? and most of the transformation will be done, uh, uh, will be done before uh, there is any bainite uh, formed. Hmm? However, if we now uh, add, look at same alloy, but now with molybdenum added, yes, and I put in the same curve, yes, I can see now that the microstructure will be very different, because with the same cooling rate, I have now no perlite or ferrite formation, and the entire microstructure will be veined. Other elements of importance is uh, boron. Boron, I want to say a few words about boron because it's also one of these elements that has a very pronounced effect on the ferrite uh, formation. Yes. This is the uh, phase diagram. The influence of boron on the phase diagram, iron carbon phase diagram. And you can see that as you add, Minute amounts of uh, boron, so 0.002% of boron in weight, that's uh, uh, 20 ppm of boron in weight, 50 ppm of boron in weight, we see that the austenite stability is reduced. So 
So boron is obviously an element that is ferrite stabilized. Yes? But what does it do and why do we add it? Well, this image shows you uh, the impact of small amounts of boron. Mm -hmm. In this particular micrograph, what you see is the effect of 20 ppm of boron as on an as-cast microstructure of a conventional carbon manganese constructional steel that contains a little bit of titanium. Yes. Um, and the original austenite grain boundaries are here. Yes. And normally, when you um, uh, have the austenite to ferrite uh, transformation, the ferrite is nucleated at the grain boundaries. Yes. Right here. Yes. And then these uh, ferrite nuclei grow. Yes, and um, and eventually you get the entire uh, structure, your entire volume is transformed from austenite to um, ferrite. Now, you can see here that uh, there's absolutely no ferrite formation at these boundaries. Instead, we have these very large ferrite grains inside the austenite. So the nucleation of ferrite is at austenite, at what we call prior austenite grain boundaries, is suppressed by boron. Okay. This is one of the major effects that boron has uh, in steels, and that's why we very um, uh, often use boron in steel, is to, 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 to have this extreme suppression of ferrite nucleation yes. and this is illustrated here for uh, this time a TTT diagram with the TTT diagram this TTT diagram um, the steel carbon steel 0.19% uh, carbon 1.6% manganese and what we add now is um, we add 35 ppm of uh, boron. So originally the transformation will start at, say, if you're looking at uh, 560 degrees C, yes, D, it takes about, uh, so this is 10 seconds, this is 20 seconds. It takes less than 20 seconds to start the transformation. If we add the boron, yes, at the same temperature, the transformation will start at uh, something like uh, 20, uh, 34, about 50 seconds, so twice the time, yes? And it will take uh, to be completed uh, a much longer time also. It's a very pronounced effect of boron on the transformation. So what I've tried to show you up to now is the effect that um, key elements such as silicon, manganese, chromium, and moly, and excuse me, also boron, have on the transformation. And will, this is used in many um, steels, yes, uh, this, this adding alloying elements to achieve certain suppress or promote certain transformation so that we get um, the microstructure that we need just by alloying. Uh, there are steels where uh, we use a combination of alloying and deformation rain, yes, uh, to achieve properties. This is uh, done 
in particular for so-called um, microalloy steels, very effectively, microalloy steels. And I just want to illustrate here what, uh, and we'll come back to this because some of the concepts are a little bit maybe to be uh, novel to you. Um, come back to this at later stages when we talk about actual products, but we can as well introduce this, these concepts now. So in these steels, as I said when I introduced uh, alloying elements, uh, we add small amounts of microalloying additions. And the typical microalloying additions in steels are niobium, titanium, and vanadium. What happens when I add niobium? Well, when we add niobium to steel, we can suppress a phenomenon called recrystallization. And that allows us to do the decomposition of austenite not from recrystallized austenite, but from strained or deformed uh, engineers in the field of HSLA steels, microalloy HSLA steels, like to use the word pancaked austenite. This is the way the, the microstructure is deformed. And that has an impact on the transformation. So for instance, here I show the uh, schematic of a CCT diagram for niobium-free uh, constructional steel yeah, and with 400 ppm of niobium. What you see is that the, all the transformations, the transformation reactions, the composition reaction of austenite are uh, occurring at higher temperatures and are occurring at shorter times. Yes. Okay. Um, that's one thing that happens. Another thing that happens in these steels is the following, is that in the strained austenite, the precipitation reactions are also Deformation enhances both transformations and precipitation reactions. And that's very interesting because it allows us to do what's called thermomechanical processing of steels to obtain certain microstructures, in particular grain refined microstructures. Um, so what happens if we look at the, in these steels, we form so-called niobium carbides precipitates, yes. If we look at the static precipitation of niobium carbide, we see that it takes at around 900, in the range of 900 to 1,000 degrees C, it takes about 100 seconds to pre start precipitation of the niobium carbide, and the precipitation is completed after very, very long times, yes, at in that temperature range. However, if I can do, if I can deform the matrix and measure the precipitation kinetics of niobium carbide, what I see is that the precipitation in the, well, the same temperature range is now uh, for instance, n a 900 degrees, it takes one second rather than 100 seconds to uh, start, yes, and it's completed in less than 100 seconds. So I get a tremendous uh, increase of the nucleation rate and growth rate of um, uh, precipitation rate, let's put it this way, uh, the uh, niobium. So let's stop uh, at this stage uh, with the lecture and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much for your attention.